so this is the last presentation of today. And, and this is a group presentation by members of the online language teaching develop online language material development team at Salkar. So this is going to be a joint presentation and we will be talking about the state of our online language teaching materials and some of the challenges we have met as well as some of the issues that we have that we have come across in preparing online language teaching materials. And in doing so, we will also illustrate some of the exercises and some of the methods that we use and some of the technology that we use in, in creating these, these language teaching materials. So, um, Salkar, Center for Languages of the Central Asian Region, is one of the 16 national language resource centers in the United States supported by the Department of Education. So it's the Title VI Center, one of the 16 national language resource centers in the United States, and the only one that focuses on Central Asian languages. So it focuses on this entire geography. So it's a vast geography, a vast area, which has a lot of different languages. The focus is more on this area, like, of course, Turkey and Iran aren't really in Central Asia, but Turkey has a language, Turkish, which is a Turkic language, and most of the, so all these languages are Turkic languages. And Iran, again, even though it's not in, in, in Central Asia, Persian or Parsi spoken in Iran is, is an Iranian language, right? So these languages are Iranian languages spoken in Central Asia. So, there are lots of languages here, for example, Uzbek, Kazakh, or Mongolian, Tibetan, Dari, Pashto, Tajik, Turkmen, so lots of languages, mostly Turkic and, and Iranian languages, and also some Mongolic languages, and, and also, also Tibetan. So lots of languages. So, so far, most of what Salkar did as a language resource center, as a national language resource center, was to prepare textbooks for these languages. So lots of peer-reviewed and high-quality textbooks that have been prepared according to the latest pedagogy and methodology. Um, so this was good, and you know those textbooks are necessary for these languages. But what is the motivation to start preparing online language classes. So how did we start? So even though we have these textbooks, of course, not every university can teach these languages, right? Because most of the time the enrollment is like two or three students, and of course most universities cannot afford to teach these courses if the enrollment is going to be about two or three students, or one or two students. And of course, not every student who is interested in learning these languages can afford to travel to, to come to Indiana University. So we thought, okay, so we have all these nice, great textbooks, but you know, not everybody can study with these textbooks. So we need something to make people study Central Asian languages, to make the study more available. So came the idea of preparing online language courses and therefore being able to reach the entire nation so someone from the west coast or east coast can take these courses through IU once they are prepared. Um, so the first step was once we made the decision to prepare online, online language courses the first step was, of course, to put this in our main grant, which is from the Department of Education, Title VI. So we put this in the grant, and hope, fortunately, we, we got renewed for 2014 to 2018. So in this grant cycle, in addition to preparing textbooks, we also are preparing, preparing online language classes. So the first step was, of course, to put it in the grant, because you know you need some funds to prepare these, 
this language process. And then the next step, once the funds were approved, was to establish a team for online language preparation. And I think, you know, these processes, these steps might also be relevant to other programs who, which, which intend to have similar, you know, purposes in preparing online language courses. So I think this was a good, I believe, a, a good strategy to establish the online language preparation team. And actually those team members will be presenting several parts of the presentation today. So, and I will be introducing them. So, who are the online language course preparation team? Who are they composed of? So, one of them is the assistant director of Salkar, Dave Bayer, who is the person who takes care of the administrative aspects of online course development. So, there are lots of things that require administrative procedures, sometimes talking to various units on campus and getting their feedback and a variety of things. So, and Amber, our language instructional specialist at Salkar, is the person who is in charge of the pedagogical side of, side of things and also language instructional design. And she works one-to-one, -one, one -on one-on-one with developers such as Rahman Jan, Rahman, Rahman Arman, who is our lead developer for um, Dari and Pashto. So Amber works one-on-one -on -one with these developers and comes up with the content and as well as instructional design of, of, of these materials. So, so far, the administrative aspect, right, the instructional aspect, ped pedagogical aspect, of course, the content. And the next person is Sudra. Sudra takes care of the technological side of these things. Because since these are online courses, of course, ideally, uh, you need someone who is also really good at technology. Definitely much better than I am at technology. I know how to check my emails and all that, but uh, I cannot prepare all those fancy apps that Suhrab can. So Suhrab deals with the technological side of content development or, or uh, design development, the design, multimedia design process. So, so each of these team members are now going to talk about their part of the process and how we prepare these online language courses. Currently, we are preparing online courses for Dari and Pashto, obviously, which are, which are the languages where we made the most progress so far. Dari and Pashto, which are both languages spoken in Afghanistan. And Uyghur, Uzbek, Mongolian, and in fact, our Mongolian developer is also here. And, and, and also Tibetan. So these are the languages we have started with. Of course, we, are, we intend to move on to other Central Asian languages at some point, but these are the ones we have started with. So now Amber and, so Dave first. Dave is going to talk about the administrative aspects, and then Amber and Rahman are going to talk about the instructional design. So they are going to be explaining it together, which is gonna give you in an illustrative way, it's going to illustrate how they work one-on-one, -on -one, a developer and a pedagogy specialist in creating these materials. And then, finally, Sujab is going to show you some of the apps that we have, some of the technological tools that we use, and some of the games, I don't know, like all these technologically advanced tools that we have, the tools that people like me are unable to create. So I invite Dave to talk about the administrative issues. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, how many of you ever been in a meeting where you discussed developing an online language course? Was it a good experience? Bad experience? So-so experience? <clears throat> I've been in meetings regarding online language development in which people were 
who had assignments to create online language courses were so frustrated with the process that they were in tears. <clears throat> they, I don't have an assignment. Excuse me, I have an assignment and I'm alone. I don't have a team like you do. I have no one to counsel with and nowhere to go. If you feel that way, please know that there's a lot of people that are right there with you. And our job today is to tell you where we have been with this and hopefully there's something that you can walk away with and apply to your own situation. When starting out, we talked with as many IU folks as we could who have happened to be involved with online course development. We had no idea where to begin and we talked to them as people who might be able to help us find our way. Building the community and learning from others takes time. As more people at IU start to develop online courses, it's unlikely that folks such as the ones that we talked to may be able to take time to talk to everyone when they start out. And yet people starting out will still need somebody to help them find their way. Thoughtful discussions should address who will that be. IU already has a number of thoughtful resources in place to help address the concerns of people just starting out in online course design. These include, but are not limited to, the Office of <coughs> Online Education, the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning, the University Information Technology Services, the Center for Language Technology, and the Center for Language Excellence. Each is a cog in the wheel on, in online course development at, at my educational institution. They are truly helpful and are a great way to start to, um, a great start to providing online courses, online developers with the resources that they need and, are, and their ample efforts are not to be minimized. However, as you examine the, <coughs> the various resources available to you at your business organization or your university, check for gaps. Are there any gaps between the guidance that is currently provided? and the guidance that many budding online course developers currently need. If no gaps exist, are the various COGS communicated? Groups starting out with their online efforts may know some of the groups that, that I've talked about, or the groups that are like them. And other people starting out in their online efforts may not know of any of these resources at all. Part of the discussion of don't reinvent the wheel must address how we get the water to the end of the row so that not only are the cogs all in place on the wheel, but that people know about them. When determining your needs, human resource needs, technology needs, any other kind of needs, one of the keys is to look for what's missing. Some groups at a university aren't far enough along to know what's missing. It's not only a matter of understanding the technology. The issue is much broader. And again, you may have have to initiate thoughtful discussions at various levels of your organization or your university. What resources will they need? Here at CELCAR, we did a thorough needs analysis. We did ours through Google, collaborating with as many folks as possible, for example, the School of Education here at IU. And we polled potential customers, existing customers, and people that we knew through social, social media. When starting out with, an on, with online course development, Another key first is to determine what your organization needs, how you might leverage online resources to help your university shine and help your group shine. Most people are inclined to start with possible technology solutions, and that's a mistake. We were talking about that earlier. Thank you. You both pointed that out earlier. Instead, first determine your strategies, and then look to tech solutions that help you meet those strategies rather than the other way around. Some groups, again, are not far enough along that they, that they have no idea where, how to be able to establish basic goals and where they need to be going. And they need someone to help them with some basic guidance. So the next point is get out there and explore. Quality online ed course ed development demands so much more than just the technology. While knowing what's available is important, you also have, it's much more important that you know how to apply what you see out there. One of the first things that we did as a team was to go on online and look at online language courses that were available out there. 
And we learned that 80% of them are sadly inadequate. And from the other 20%, we got some very important things. But it was surprising to us that there were so many that we just thought, we do not want to do this this way. <clears throat> is it possible that it makes more sense in your university, excuse me, it, did your university want to invest um, if, on every single individual group to invest 80% of their time in finding out what is not really adequate? It may make more sense to have some central group that helps you guide away from the 80% and guide you towards 20% that might fit your, your particular situation. The next point is technology. Do you ha have someone in your group to have, that you can come to in order to seek advice or more importantly to develop certain electronic resources or help you modify or adapt resources that you created yourself? What general human resource needs does your group have? Of these resources, which may you reasonably expect your group to provide, and which are the needs that you are never going to be able to provide in your group that you're going to have to look to someone else in your organization or university. The next point is instructional design and pedagogy. On quality online course development demands creative use of sound principles of pedagogy, and we've been talking about some of those today. <clears throat> and also um, sound principles of instructional design. Until online pedagogists and online instructional designers become more available in the world, your university may wish to explore which pieces it needs at the various levels of your university. So, listen to people and avoid tears. Shareholders at any level should be, willing, should be listening to people on the ground who are doing online course development or have done it in the past. Here at Indiana University, the folks of the various organizations that I've talked to have, are doing a great job of listening to people and providing the things that we really need. And yet, as I said at the beginning, I've been in meetings where somebody was in tears because they didn't even know about these other resources that were available here at IU. Shareholders who encourage online course development should feel a strong need to minimize frustrations such as these. Listening will help. That's a great place to start. Also, feed the hungry. People are hungry to learn more and to be able to do these things. Several people have approached me in administrative meetings where we've talked about our online efforts and asked me a whole bunch of questions afterwards. Again, some of them knew of some of these organizations we're talking about, and some of them didn't know about them at all. They would like to be able to do online course development, and they were frustrated that they didn't have the answers that they were looking for. They should be able to contact the general human resources at IU or at your university and ha that happen to have the answers they seek. They have these answers right now. If we succeed at making the answers well known, then frustration can be reduced and more importantly, our chances are greater that we'll be able to provide a quality product. So in conclusion, if people don't get the answers that they need in order to develop quality online courses at your university, then that they'll meet their deadlines anyway, and it increases the chances they'll become part of the 80% that really is substandard. We want this not to happen. You can keep this from happening. Our chances of being part of the professional 20% are increased if we have the right resources in place, human resources and otherwise, and at each level at the university. Um, raise your voice, get the discussions going, Thoughtful discussions should address at each of your organizations what resources will this be. And now, Rahman and Amber will discuss the instructional design aspects of what we do. because it feels like everyone in this room knows a lot about pedagogy and good design. Um, but I think that maybe it'll still be interesting to you because we're going to have a lot of examples. And we're going to just tell you like how we put some of these things into action. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. I have um, a background in applied linguistics and computational linguistics. 
and I also have, um, uh, now I have just recently received a graduate certificate in ISD. So I have both of those back, or instructional systems design. Sorry, I forget <laughs> who knows what that's about. Um, so basically what I do at the center as a language instructional designer is I oversee the pedagogical design of the materials and the courses. Um, or we don't do courses, but the coursework. So first of all, I work closely with our director, who's also the center's applied linguist, the chief applied linguist. And um, so we work together to find the research. Um, and then, like Onair said, I work one-on-one -on -one with the developers very collaboratively on the actual curriculum and content. And uh, my name is Ramon Armand. As, uh, as uh, Onair mentioned, I'm the Afghan language expert and lead languages developer on online, online courses at Soka. And also, as previously mentioned, uh, SOCA has several developers. All developers in SOCA, they are experienced teachers, instructors, and also language material developers with, with an experience to uh, peer review uh, textbook development. We all uh, developers bring our years of experience to the table, both in teaching and developing language material. To, to create the best and best quality material for our languages, for our languages, as we are finally the ones who are responsible for the content of the course. So, um, start, we mentioned a little bit, I think in a couple different presentations, that you always want the form to fit the function, not the function to fit the form. So be, the reason that pedagogy and content are are presenting before technology is because that comes before technology in the design. And the first thing that we do is we begin with our curriculum. Um, so how many people here are familiar with backwards course design? Okay, so most people. So, All right, great. So you know that in backwards course design, um, you begin by defining your learning outcomes. So we just, this is an example from um, module one, lesson three. And the main goal of this lesson is to teach learners how to write in Dari, which uses a Perzo Arabic script. Um, so for our learning outcomes, we just ask ourselves, what do we want the learners to be able to know? And specifically, we ask ourselves, what do they have to have mastered in order to be done with this lesson and move on to the next lesson? Um, so sometimes, we're asking the learners to produce something, um, like, write your name, um, but then sometimes, because at this level, we're not really expecting them to produce something reliably and consistently, we just ask them to identify, to be able to show that they understand the concept, even though they can't reliably produce it yet. Once we've established what we want them to know, the next step is we have to think about, well, how are we going to know that they know what we want them to know, especially when we're saying, you know, identify or understand, right? And those, usually when you're writing learning objectives, they tell you don't use those kinds of words, but we use them anyway, because we're crazy. Um, so what we do is then we say, okay, we're gonna need an app. And in this app, for example, um, where, where did I, click on the two form letters, when prompted, label the isolated and final forms. So we're gonna need an app and it's going to show all the letters of the Dari alphabet, and they're literally going to click on the letters, letters who form, so that they're showing us that they're you know, identifying those letters. And then for each of those letters, they're going to label, they're going to be shown um, the forms, the initial and the final, and they're going to label which one's initial and final, showing us that they understand. So the next step after we complete the learning outcomes and assessments, we are thinking about what kind of activities, texts, and practices we need to develop our learners. Uh, so so they, they can engage with the language properly and achieve the skills we mentioned or identified in their learning outcomes. In other uh, language, in other words, we still can say how well we can engage the students to, to practice the language before we access their ability. Typically, we think about ideas to what kind of practices and activities are needed here and we fill out this column. 
So um, the, the main way we do this as we're building the lesson is we use scaffolding techniques. So we try to focus on starting with the more controlled and contrived practice exercises, which are more perceptive, um, and they're highly repetitive, and they have a more restrictive focus on a specific skill. Rockland's going to give you some examples. And you see the examples here, uh, those examples needs prompt answer and provides a prompt answer for the students. For example, matching exercise. In the matching exercise, it's a part of our uh, first uh, lesson in the, the first module. So students, uh, we provide for our students some uh, long, word, uh, long words from English, which is very common in Dari and Pashto. So students, they read and they recognize the word and they compare to the their equivalent in English. As well as the fill in the blank, which uh, we provide the English equivalent for them and the students must fill in the blank with the required words. And uh, 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 again, they will uh, receive uh, immediate feedback on that. As well. And multiple choices. As a Dari and Pashto has uh, 18 uh, primary shapes, and each shape turned by the diacritic. So if you put diacritic, change the, the, the sound of each uh, letter. So we create uh, activity for our, uh, for our uh, alphabets. So the student, they read the information and they choose the best option for each of the questions asked for them. And also, putting in order, basically provide a uh, conversation between two people. They listen to the conversation and they put in order the phrases as they hear. And also two of true thoughts. They listen to audio or they read some information and they, they choose the true form. Um, next we provide what we call our activities. So we differentiate between those for ourselves. And these are the ones that are a little more controlled, uh, are, are still a little more controlled, um, but they allow more opportunity for the students to produce original language and not just you know answering something that we can we already know the right answer. Um, because of that, the, there's no right or wrong, so we can't give immediate feedback on these kinds of activities the way that we could in the exercises. Um, so what we're experimenting with right now is three different modes of assessment. Um, so we're using some self-assessment where we have them do it and then we have them check their answers. Sometimes we might have them listen to a model and then compare, or sometimes we just might have them you know, listen to themselves and then say, does it sound right to you? Um, and then we also use peer example, for example, um, in the discussion, or did I say peer example? Peer assessment, for example, in the discussion boards. Um, and then, of course, we also have some instructor evaluation via the, uh, primarily through the, as the assignment section or the quizzes. For example, uh, we have some activities uh, in our modules that requires information so we basically for this example which is uh, answering questions we provide authentic text for students uh, such as business cards they read the information and they provide answer for each of the question uh, under each uh, uh, picture then they record themselves and uh, post their uh, recording of their work to the discussion board which will be assessed by one of their classmates or the instructor and also we have completing sentences. We provide some uh, uh, incomplete sentences for the students. They fill, the, uh, fill those uh, incomplete sentences and complete them. Then they record themselves as a monologue and uh, post their work again to the discussion board or assignment. And then uh, the work will be checked by the instructor. I want to interject really quickly too. If you're looking at this, um, and you're wondering how it's interactive, some of these examples haven't been fully developed yet by the technology. The pedagogy has been done, the examples have been written, but the technology hasn't been done, if you have that question. So, sorry, I didn't say that earlier. <laughs> and responding to a prompt. In this kind of exercise, again, it requires the instructors or the classmates assessment. We have a discussion board or assignment. We provide some 
words about the individual in the picture, the student they must write some pictures by following the first example that has been done for them. And then they post their work again to the assignment board or discussion board, which will be assessed by the second. <clears throat> so we started with the very highly controlled exercises, right, where they got immediate feedback, and then we did the activities, which they had a little more um, ability to be creative, and um, we used different kinds of assessments there. Then we move on to the tasks, and these are um, where they can be the most creative with their language, where they're going to be making like more original speech. Um, these are usually, you know, we try to, try to create a scenario. We want them to be able to communicate in a meaningful way. Um, we try to make it a way that we think that they might authentically use the language in, um, in when they're going to be speaking with other uh, speakers of the L2. Uh, we provide role-play situations for a student. The student must record a video and then post it to the discussion board. And uh, the instructor or one of the classmates will replay to them. As you see in this example, uh, some parts of the conversation has been uh, recorded by the instructor, and the, then each student will listen to the, uh, this video and they reply to it, and then record themselves and post the discussion. Let's uh, play. Uh, I don't think that that. Was the okay. Yeah. We will uh, show you. We play some videos later, but that's not that. Did you want to talk about that? Uh, yeah. As Yes, uh, as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is just another example of, um, I think we play some Skype videos a little bit later, but this is an example of, um, we, when we were talking about how to use different authentic texts, and, um, you know, it's hard in some of these countries to get, like, video that we can use in our materials and have, you know, copyright, blah, blah, blah. And so we use Skype because Skype is something authentic. And there was actually a lot of discussion back and forth. And I said, look, when you call your family in Afghanistan, do you Skype? Yeah, Skype. Then it's authentic, right? So that's how we brought Skype into it. OK, so um, once we finish, um, oh, let's one, OK, let's return to the, um, the so once we finish our discovery practice method, then um, we have to think about, okay, how are we going to deliver the content, right? So like in your classroom, this is basically your instructor talk time. Um, and we've been kind of experimenting with different modes. Um, and one of, so we've been trying live action videos, we've been trying animated videos. I don't know if you guys have ever used like Powtoons or Animate Me. Um, and just trying paragraph form, where they have to you know, just read an explanation. And we're just experimenting with those three different ways of introducing the content. Uh, so we're thinking about uh, which one of the content uh, delivery methods are most effective for our learners. And we are in the process of researching uh, this, uh, those methods. Uh, our hypothesis is, that students or the learners will prefer the video sections, which is much closer to the real or traditional classroom uh, environment. But we see there are some benefits in the paragraph section as well, which is students that can, they can control their, uh, their learning uh, pace, and uh, they can practice and read and reread the section as much as they want. So we are interested to seek students' feedbacks in the future to learn which method is better for, for our uh, courses. <coughs> and finally, the last call in the backward design is used for notes to ourselves, such as grammar notes, resources, uh, like textbook, required textbook to the course, or workbook. And as well, we can ask the student, we put notes to the student to download one of our uh, free smart devices application, which has been developed by our technology so I also want to point out another kind of discussion we had about the textbook. So we have these great textbook, textbooks that we've already written, right? Um, and so I said, well, we have to make sure we use the textbooks. We have to refer to the textbooks. 
And the instructors were like, can we do that? And I said, well, of course. You have a course, you can require a textbook. I mean, I don't know, how many of you guys have taken an online course yourself? Really? You should take an, if you're gonna teach an online course, you should take one, I'm serious. I, so when I did um, my instructional design graduate certificate, it was all online. It was here in Bloomington. They have two kids, I have a full-time job. I did it online. Every single one of my courses had two or three required textbooks. I mean, it's still a course. You can require a textbook. And if you have a good textbook, you can use it. So yes, we do use our textbooks and our workbooks. So we've already had some talk about this today, so I'm going to try not to go over it too much. But yeah, as I was doing research, and I was like, okay, what's, what's the difference between pedagogy online and in the classroom? Is there a difference? And I guess the big thing I just kept seeing over and over again was the emphasis on switching to a more learner-centered classroom. Um, so with that in mind, and I was trying to choose which instructional design model are we going to follow, one of the biggest things that I thought of for a learner-centered classroom is just the motivation. How do you get the students interested and keep them interested? I mean, no matter how highly motivated they are to take the language, if you've got a super, super boring class, they're going to get bored, right? So I decided to go with um, a framework that I just, I, I think it's a good one for creating and keeping motivation. And that's um, Keller's art model of motivational design. And the basis of this model, for those of you who aren't aware, is um, it's designing lessons that grab the learner's attention, that model relevance, that build confidence, and that ensure learner satisfaction. I mean, sounds good, right? So that's what we try to do. So Keller says that to grab attention, there's two main ways. You can use perceptual arousal or inquiry arousal. Um, and we try to use both throughout the module. For example, here in this instructional video of which we prepared for module one lesson one, we are trying to go ahead, keep going. We are trying to uh, access the perceptual arousal. We try to include in this uh, video a very visual, interesting, authentic background, involve both L1 and L2 speakers, and also uh, dress. Or the characters with authentic modern Afghan clothing as possible, as they as they uh, introduce the content, uh, instructional content. Additionally, to the perceptual arousal, we are seeking the uh, trying to access the inquiry arousal as well. Hold on, by wait. before we do inquiry, let's let them listen to a little of our video. Just my I say, Namimon Amber S. I speak really good. Sorry, your name. Say your name. Oh my god, you guys all speak Dari. Awesome. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Nami man rahmanas. Nami shumachis. Nami man amber es. We've got the body language, right? Next, you will practice applying what you learn. <laughs> so, I mean, and again, I just want to. So, after we were so proud of this video. And then we sent it to the person at um, Seattle, and she's like, you know, those kids in the background are freaking me out. Can you do it again with a different background? So it's, it's a learning process, right? I mean, did it, did, it, did it, any of your attentions come off of these two beautiful people to the kids in the background? Because the heads are bigger than the yeah. people. <laughs> it's a learning process, but again, because, oh, really? okay. because, yeah, because we're a team, now our team members who are gonna go make videos, they're not gonna repeat the same mistake. And I love that. I love that we're learning from each other. Yes. And as a presentation, we are trying to uh, access the inquiry arousal as well by asking the students to join the discussion board and talk about the video they saw, what differences they see between culture and the language, but in the body part gesture as well. Um, and because we're dealing with adult learners, it's especially important to establish relevance to the material. Although as a mother of eight-year-olds, I can tell you, even kids want to know, why do they need to learn this, right? But with adults, it's really important. Um, we need to make clear connections between what they're learning 
and the value of what's being learned. And we do this through incorporating realistic language use, which shows clear connections between how they will actually use the language in the classroom in real life. For example, in this activity you see, a student send a text message to her as a classmate, says, hi, my name is Rashad, I'm a student at Herat University. Are you my classmate, Farid? Thank you. So, uh, as in this case, we uh, uh, the students must, the other student or the, uh, the teacher must reply appropriately to that text message. Texting is not, uh, text, texting is a realistic uh, mode of communication uh, where the learner must read and write a conversation. It is uh, not equal or uh, parallel to the listening and speaking, but still they will face it in the target language in the real life. And as you see, we have, uh, we can also point out the, as the other realistic communication modes, uh, examples like Skype videos, and uh, newspaper, uh, magazine articles, newspaper clippings, and social media. All those uh, examples are uh, communicative for learners that they will face in the target language in their life. Is this the video? No, we don't show that. So next we focus on building the learner's confidence in themselves and their ability to learn the target language. And part of how we do this is through um, clearly defined learning objectives. Um, research shows that if you tell a learner from the get-go what's expected of them and what they will be able to do upon completion of the module, it makes it more likely that they're actually going to be able to achieve those goals. So we start every lesson with a, this is what you're going to learn in this module. Um, we also build confidence by aligning the pace and level of the difficulty of the content to the learner's ability following Krashen's input hypothesis. Um, we feel like it's especially important to follow this, you know, challenging enough so they don't get bored, but not so challenging they get frustrated, because unlike in a regular classroom, you don't have a, an instructor there who can, you know, keep doing those really casual formative assessments and then differentiate, right? So we need to, we're really focusing on getting that good I plus one from the get-go. Um, and also, we feel like, you know, again, just based on research that we've read, that um, the online environment itself helps reduce anxiety because of the extra practice and built-in response time, which gives students more control over their own learning experience, and in effect, it automatically helps lower the effective filter. Yes, as an Amber, uh, Amber uh, pointed out, the advantage of online environment uh, compared to the traditional classroom is time. The students have control, that can, they can control the learning pace and the time, and they can practice as much as they want. To encourage uh, this kind of uh, learning autonomy, our practices, the direction of our each practice reminds the student to repeat and practice as, man, as many times as they want each exercise until they're ready to move on to the next level, to the next lesson. Here's an example, uh, an application example, which has been uh, developed by our technologist, Saurabh Jang. He will show you, he will demonstrate later for you guys. This uh, application teach the students the alphabets of learning. And it sounds in different positions. You see in the uh, beginning, initial, middle, and final. The students are able to click on the letter, on the uh, IPA, on the picture, on the sound, as many, as many times as they want until they feel, feel comfortable and they learn the, the activity and they, they're ready to move. So that this kind of personalized instructional uh, pace is not realistic in traditional uh, classroom uh, because, uh, the teacher, yeah, know, and the time, you. and also the yeah. time is uh, depend on all classroom, not only on one person. Right. You know, like, it might take me 10 times to press it, but if you already knew another Iranian language, it might only take you two, right? Um, so, furthermore, we so we want satisfaction, and he talks about using two different types of satisfaction. So there's obviously 
intrinsic reinforcement um, and extrinsic reinforcement. And for intrinsic reinforcement, um, again, we want them to feel confident, feel like they're doing a good job, and so we made sure clearly stated goals. Here's an example of our clearly stated goals. This is what you're going to learn. This is what you're going to be able to do. This is what you're going to be able to do with the, this is the culture you're going to learn. Frequent formative assessments um, so that they, I, I mean, nothing bothers me more in a class than when I'm doing something and wondering, am I doing it right? Right? So we're just building in lots of assessments, self-assessments, peer assessments, instructor assessments, so that they know whether or not they're doing it right. And then timely feedback. Um, we try to do immediate feedback whenever possible through the activities, but obviously we can't do it through everything. Um, for intrinsic reinforcement, so that's where Dave talked about our needs analysis, and we just tried to figure out, you know, what do they need? Do they want a degree? Do they want a certificate? Do they want credit? You know, so we just aligned our deliver deliverables to what our needs analysis said our learners need. And of course, at the forefront of our development has to be good SLA theory. Um, we use a lot of different SLA theories, you guys. You guys all know about SLA theory. So I'm just gonna tell you the main one that we use. We just, and this is because we use the communicative language teaching. I know it was mentioned earlier, it's kind of old, but I promise you I will look up the article on globalization and see if we need to change it. That's the other great thing about online development. Unlike a textbook that once it's printed and it's done, if we decide that we need to make changes to online, you can change like that, right? So, um, but we like communicative language teaching. And so the first thing that we like to do is communication through interactions. Um, yes, I, as you see in this example, uh, we are uh, giving a task to students in the discussion board with some bullet points, which is, uh, we leave the student to be in that limited area, the information they achieved in the classroom. The student, student base basically they go uh, to the discussion board and they answer, and if they do, they complete the task and post their uh, work to the discussion board. And then <laughs> other students, they reply to their, uh, to their uh, questions or the answer, and the answer will, they will answer the question which, we, which has been uh, uh, proposed by other students. And you will see, uh, again, you will see the video later. They use me as a guinea pig a lot. Can yes. you tell? <laughs> um, okay, so, oh, this is you too. Uh, yes. Uh, as we mentioned before, uh, we use all authentic text as often as possible. Uh, in Sunco Library, we have a lot of authentic text which, which has been provided by our developers when they travel to, our, to their uh, target languages, native languages, uh, countries, sorry. And, and also we use web resources like BBC or Voice of America, which we have permission for those, uh, official permission, we can use the resources in our language material. And we can scan as much as uh, uh, authentic uh, material as well and use them in their own activities. Okay. All right, so we are, we're running really low on our time, so we talked a lot, sorry guys. Um, so again, we want students to be aware of their learning process. And we do it in different ways, or we just, number one, through self-assessments, self but then sometimes we ask them specifically to focus on an issue and to discuss it. I'm kind of, he doesn't know that, I'm kind of skipping through our cards because <laughs> yes. we're low on time. <laughs> uh, in this example, basically, we pay, make the, uh, grab the attention of the students to the, some uh, challenges that uh, they, they face to pluralize animate objects to, and versus to inanimate objects. Because in animate objects, in Dari, they can pluralize two or three uh, items of the sentence, two elements of the sentence. But in inanimate objects, in Dari, they only can pluralize one element of the sentence, if it, even if it's a pluralized sentence. All right, um, so we're gonna go through this really quickly. So you guys know that you're supposed to have them talk about personal experiences, so this is how we do it. <laughs> I'm trying to 
gonna get you guys out of here on time. Okay, in a national, uh, in, in, in a traditional classroom, uh, we're talking about, in a traditional classroom, they can't yes, usually, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the traditional classroom, the fluency of uh, learners at the intellectual level is barrier to share their personal information. Uh, so well, they, they know what they want to say, but they don't have access to the information, to the form and the vocabulary. So uh, however, in an online environment, they have more opportunity to control that time wise, as we mentioned before. And finally, we incorporate so our. Just, just talk about because we don't have time to watch yeah, it. So we incorporate our, lang our languages uh, to the realistic uh, language use, our classroom to the realistic language use by Skype chatting. Uh, usually, in traditional classroom, we have coffee hours. So this type of activity will replace with our coffee hours and we will connect with the uh, native speakers. And we also can uh, invite guest speakers via conference call. Okay, and we can, I don't want you guys to miss out on everything so Carl is gonna tell you. We've already gone over our time, but I'm just gonna finish up by saying, as you can see, as in, I mean, for anybody who does design, it's just a reiterative process. I mean, you, you come up with what you think your good curriculum is, you get your design model, your methods, you start developing. Um, we're gonna be testing this summer um, through... Uh, Wisconsin University summer workshop this summer. We will do a lot of innovation with our and we're gonna, uh, students. Mm -hmm. We're gonna see what works and we're gonna see what doesn't work and we're gonna change. So I just wanted to mention really quickly, and again, I don't have time to really go through it, but if you wanna ask me more about it later, we're self-evaluating our own program because we wanna make sure that we did a good job. So first we've developed a self-evaluation that we use to evaluate our own work. This is the first page, it's three pages long, but it talks about you know, incorporating the five C's. Um, incorporating, uh, I don't even, I'm like totally off my cards. Incorporating um, communicative language, incorporating chunking, all of those kinds of things. And we're just going through and asking ourselves, are we meeting our own standards? And if not, we gotta make an improvement. Um, then the other thing is we developed an end user evaluation that we will give to the people who pilot for us. And it's asking a lot of the same questions, but it's just asking it like in a less linguistic -y way, right? Because these are students, not linguists. And then the last thing we do is we actually have two university departments that um, have offered to do an external, actually, I mean, it's external to us, not the university. Um, so Quality Matters is a national standard for online course. It's not specifically for language learning, which is an online course. And they offered to evaluate it for us. And that way, I feel like if we evaluate it, if our users evaluate it, and then we also have third-party people who know design evaluate it, and everybody gives it a gold star, then I feel like we can say with confidence we have developed a good, solid curriculum. And now we're gonna pass it on to the really good stuff. Presented, and I start sweating and talking more. But um, so Super is going to talk about the really good fancy stuff, which is all of our technology. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Ramon. Uh, as we are very short on time, I'll try to skip and fly through the slides and just cover the main points. Basically, uh, as a as an IT specialist at Salka, I'm trying to bring the static textbook text content life and having background in graphic design and programming. I am helping all of our instructors to develop customized to the target language activities. We, for a while we were thinking about developing our own platform to, do, to deliver online courses and as soon as the University announced moving from in-house build learning management system on course to Canvas, we decided just to, to adopt it. As many other language management systems systems as Blackboard or QuickChalk or NEO, all of them has their, their own pluses and minuses. And we can all agree on the pluses that it's very easy and very intuitive process of posting materials for instructors and practically no orientation is needed by students to get comfortable with the interface. And uh, there are a variety of 
online tools, external third-party APIs, application programming inter interfaces that you can adapt. There are also a lot of different cons to, to the process of utilizing learning management systems. And the, the main point is here is to keep an eye on the third-party APIs that your unit is trying to adapt as we have limited control of the process. Sometimes the server is down, sometimes they run out of business and close the pro progress and your, the, your whole course can be dependent on the uh, third-party API. Make sure your university is supported, supporting the, in, the tools that you're incorporating and go with that. Uh, as, as, if, as for us, we are using Adobe Connect to utilize web conferencing technology. We are using VoiceThread for asynchronous teaching, delivering language learning content. It has been proven to us that it's a very efficient tool, especially if we decide to move on to offering online courses 100% online. It supports a great variety of uh, approaches you can take into consideration in delivering language learning materials. We, we are also trying to and experimenting with Quizlet and trying to see how we can utilize their technologies, their cloud technologies to build vocabulary building sets that we will be utilizing in the courses. We, and after analyzing all of the third party APIs, we quickly realized that we need much more to deliver more exciting and more challenging content within our online courses. We started with simple UI, user interface, and user experience changes to moving to customized language learning applications and uh, that are targeted specific to the language, to the target language, whether it's Dari, Mongolian, or Uyghur, or Tajiki, or Uzbek activities that, that we were not able to quickly find with the third party KPIs offered through the university. We, in this case, we developed the very specific application that targets memorization of the diacritics and marks in Arabic script based languages. Ramonjan came to me and said, I have a problem. My students keep forgetting marking the, the shapes when they write. And we decided to come up with extra activity that would reinforce and allow the students to practice the specific task where they can remember to assign the correct marks and diacritics when they are typing and writing. And of course, we bring elements of gamification into our process. We develop a lot of games, small games, that boost uh, the fun of the, exp the whole experience by developing vocabulary building activities that reinforce, that reinforce the knowledge of the introduced at the beginning of the lesson vocabularies. We develop multiple choice questions. We, we, deliver, we develop customized uh, you know, listening comprehension activities and a lot of very diverse set of interactive uh, applications that are designed to keep students busy outside of the required tasks in the class. And uh, of course, as technology, as mobile technology is expanding, and we can even we see more and more students concentrating and accessing the content on the go. We focus on the mobile application development. We have developed a lot of alphabet learning applications, survival phrases, and script tutorials. And, I, and as part of my presentation, I wanted to really quickly demonstrate one of the applications that we just recently finished developing. There is called the Re script tutorial that is designed to help students learn, read, and write and target that language, which is in this case would be Dari. <coughs> so, so this application is So this is the application that, it, that is ideally did, supposed to help students learn reading and writing in Dari, which starts with the alphabet section of the 
of the app where students can click and learn different the pronunciation of the letter as well as it shows them pronunciation different forms of the letter and and whether they are written in the middle or beginning or final the final form as Rahman Jal mentioned it's it's based for the self-paced learning process. Once they get comfort, learn the pronunciation and the letter themselves, they can move, in, move on to the script section of the application where you can select the letter you want to learn and observe the, hand, the more traditional handwriting process and calligraphic approach to writing. They can skip to either final and learn, observe how the final letter of the bag is written and change go to this letter and see how it's, how it's written here. Once they get comfortable with and learn how it's written, they can go to the practice activity where we have developed several set of application uh, activities on the side. It all starts with simple retracing where we can select the letter that we want to practice and simply start retracing. By now we already know the, and we familiarized ourselves with the pen movement and we know the process and at this point we just playing and trying to remember if we are doing it right. We can select different letters and keep writing. Once we get comfortable here, we move on to the next activity where we can try to evaluate our accuracy in writing in very. We can select the same bell letter that we just learned. We have been provided this beginning and end point. And in this case, we just need to recreate the shape and evaluate ourselves. So I got 86% accurate in writing. If I keep experiencing or forget what, how the shape actually looks, I can click on the show help and it gives me the trace and I can retrace and practicing. I can practice all, all of the letters here. In the next activity, we have selected, selected specific letter combinations and words as an example for us to practice, where we start with simply non-connecting letters and then we, we move on to collect connecting letters and the farther we go, the more complicated connections we get, and we get more familiar with the whole process. In the next activity, now we are trying asking students to start recognizing the shapes where we have provided the word, and at this point we need to recognize the shapes that is being used in the word and and write and can we check if it is something wrong? It gives me the instant feedback, and at the end, at the end, 